Thank you everyone for joining us and I wish you a very fruitful time in the next two hours. And to start with, I would like to welcome my colleague Edmund to just briefly take us through uh, what UMI Solution Plus is about and then I'll take uh, the participants through the agenda. Welcome Edmund. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, I guess my presentation is in, uh, is my, my PowerPoint is presentation, is it? All right, thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone. You're welcome once again to the Dar es Salaam training. This is a training organized by the Solutions Plus Project. Solutions Plus Project is an EU funded project uh, that has received funding and uh, started since January 2020. We are running this project until December 2023. We have a really large consortium of about 46 partners and then several associated uh, partners working via various platforms. Uh, we intend to support cities to transform uh, their urban transport systems and then uh, particularly also uh, injecting some kind of uh, clean uh, energy into, into urban transport system, particularly uh, with the use of uh, electricity, so, uh, which is supported via renewable energy uh, uh, sources. So indeed, the agenda for the Solutions Plus project is to promote electric mobility in our cities. And then we are doing this via various living labs in 10 different cities. And we are also in Dar es Salaam, I must say, uh, and as well as in Kigali. So we have more like captured the East African uh, region so far. Um, we indeed are carrying out various activities. We have an online toolbox that will soon be launched. And uh, we also are carrying out capacity building. So what we are doing today is part of the set of activities we are doing with, with regard to capacity building. We are also supporting local innovators with business models, as well as direct uh, funding, and then promoting also partnership between these local innovators and then the EU industry. And then of course, as I said, we are doing some city specific demonstrations, which we intend to replicate across the region. Um, we not just want to leave our activities at the demo level, we indeed want to make impact as such, we have started engaging uh, local stakeholders, regional stakeholders, national stakeholders to see to what extent we can integrate the solutions we are bringing on board into, into funding processes, into policy mechanisms in the, at the city level as well as the national level. So indeed, we are aiming to maximize uh, the impact of the activities we are doing in Solutions Plus. Uh, as I said earlier, um, we have started with data collection, uh, also uh, trying to assess the current scenarios, the baseline scenarios, and then also assess future, future scenarios in case uh, we introduce electric mobility, what to be the scenarios in the next few decades uh, to come. These assessments are all going on in the Solutions Plus project. Um, I would say that we also have a startup incubator, which is supported by our, our uh, partners, Fiel and uh, Artico where we are nurturing uh, local innovators. So we are giving out direct seed funding and uh, supporting them via the incubator with training and then as well as support from the EU industry. So we have already selected some startups that we are working with. And then we look forward to indeed bringing electric mobility to Dar es Salaam. Um, I would say that several uh, capacity building activities have been lined up. We did a global training uh, early this year, and then we also intend to follow up with a second uh, e-course, which will follow soon after the original training and then the city-specific trainings. 
We also intend to do some peer-to-peer -peer exchange activities, and we will be starting this with the city of Kigali with respect to uh, bike share sharing schemes. So if uh, our audience here are interested, we'll reach out to you when the time is up uh, so you can also participate in this training. So indeed, uh, these are the activities we are doing. And then we hope that this training will also help to a large extent to strengthen the capacity of our cities to move towards electric mobility adoption. Thank you so much. Back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you very much, Edmund. Um, with that, I would like to take all the participants through the agenda. But before doing that, I would really like to appreciate and thank uh, all the colleagues and partners that have been working with us in preparation of this uh, city training. Uh, I would like to thank FIE, Ikeada, DART, and the UN Habitat colleagues. Thank you very much. I know you've put some really hard work into this. And now, um, if, if you don't mind, since you've seen my face already, I will just stop my video to get a better quality of the um, connection and take you through um, the agenda. So our first presenter today is going to be Zubin from FIER, and he's going to take us through uh, business models for operating two and three wheelers based on our um, battery swapping. He's going to have 15 minutes uh, presenting that. And our second presenter is Mr. Shauri from ITDB. And he will take us through existing business models for operations of three wheelers in Tanzania. Thereafter, we're going to have Bradley presenting us on a case study on financial models for electric three wheelers operations. And then we're going to have a Q&A sessions for 15 minutes. So please, if you, you have any questions, just after a presenter, you can start putting the questions in the chat room. And then we are going to take those questions in the Q&A session. Um, after the Q&A session, we are going to have Gerald from Idiada, and he will take us through a general overview of the electric um, vehicle safety standards and specifically on the functional safety and emergency um, response. And our final presenter is going to be from TBS, Arnold, and he will take us through the local specific safety standards for three wheelers. And then we have our last Q&A session and a few words from UN Habitat, that and UMI. So that is how our program will look like today. And I'm really looking forward to a very fruitful discussion. Um, and maybe just to mention these sessions, uh, the two hours are going to be recorded for uh, reference or for learning for people who had not been able to join this, this training. So with that, I would like to thank you very much. Karibu uh, sana, everyone. And uh, with, without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome Zubin from FIER to take us through his presentation. Welcome, Zubin. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Zubin Naik from, uh, from Fiat Automotive. And today I'm going to, to tell you uh, a particular case about, so uh, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, two wheelers today. Um, let me share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about business models, uh, and specifically, I saw that uh, the other two presentations later after me are uh, going to be about three wheelers. So I'm going to sp speak specifically about two wheelers, and uh, we are going to talk specific we are going to compare how how are the how can you operationally uh, compare petrol electric and and battery swapping uh, electric uh, uh, scooters so um, i am zubin naik 
Uh, I work at Fear Automotive. Uh, we are a, a consultancy company in, in sustainable mobility. So uh, we work in the area of vehicles, uh, two-wheelers, uh, cars, um, trucks as well, uh, charging infrastructure, uh, mobility concepts such as uh, electric car sharing. Uh, we also uh, work in the area of sustainable policy, uh, mobility policy. And we, have, we are a part of, uh, of Solutions Plus. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor and privilege to present to you uh, today. So without further ado, let's go into the agenda. Yeah, so uh, I will we'll start with, uh, I'll present to you the project context. Uh, we are going to look at some cost comparisons, uh, then look at, okay, how do you compare uh, vehicles um, over a long period of time using the, the total cost of ownership um, parameter? Uh, we'll also look at the range uh, of different uh, kinds of electric scooters, and then we are going to draw some conclusions. So uh, to give you an introduction to the project that we, so we recently finished a project. Um, so it was in the area of uh, logistic uh, delivery in cities. Um, it was a, a food delivery company for, for which we, uh, which was a part of the project and uh, the average daily use of these scooters was around 75 kilometers per day, although there was quite some variability. So lows of, let's say from 30 kilometers to uh, upwards of 150 kilometers per day. Um, and these scooters were used for a long time. There would be different people who would be using the, those scooters uh, on different days. So um, there, there was heavy and rough use. Um, and in this specific pro uh, project, we looked at, uh, we, we did the cost comparisons uh, to compare the costs for uh, petrol scooters for electric scooters and then also for uh, battery swapping electric but then with battery swapping technology um, now the scooters that we compared were as i told you these three uh, for the electric scooters they had a range of uh, 100 kilometers and they took uh, six hours to charge um, in this project, we also tried out uh, battery swapping with, uh, with electric scooters and those had a limited range of 60 kilometers, but their charging time was much better. Uh, so they took three hours to charge. Now, when you go to, when we start comparing the costs of, of these three scooters, uh, you see that, that petrol scooters are um, cheaper uh, than electric scooters, but there are a lot of other uh, advantages that electric scooters have. Uh, so if you start with useful life, um, so what we saw is that petrol scooters were uh, useful for two years, electric scooters were useful for almost double the time, four years. Uh, the, the fuel costs, if you look at petrol, uh, especially here in Europe, uh, I'm in Netherlands, so it's heavily taxed, whereas electricity is quite cheap compared to, uh, compared to petrol and diesel. Um, if you look at the insurance and maintenance as well, so electric has uh, in the market, in the commercial market specifically, uh, electric is compared to the cost, in the insurance and maintenance of electric scooters is much uh, better than, than petrol scooters. Now we, we go into more detailed, uh, the total cost of ownership. So this is the way in which you can compare the cost of the cost of owning and, main, and using the scooters. We did this for a period of uh, four years. And what you see in the start is that uh, the petrol scooters, even though they are, uh, they are cheap to buy, but over the long term of four years, uh, they, are, uh, they are much more costlier. One big uh, difference that you see, that the one on top is the, the energy cost, so the fuel cost. You see that uh, petrols, uh, th that the amount you spend on petrol, on fuel, is much higher for, uh, for petrol scooters compared to electric ones. But what you also see is that one big difference is uh, the, the depreciation. So because in a four-year period, you would have to buy two electric, two petrol scooters. And for the electric scooters, you can do it with one. So the depreciation that you are going to attribute to the scooters is much higher. So that makes a big difference. And you see quite clear, clearly that, petrol, that electric scooters are much better than, um, than uh, petrol ones. 
now we also look at um, uh, we also looked at the what are the fixed costs what are the variable costs so the fixed costs are okay what is the de depreciation uh, what is the uh, the insurance what is the maintenance and then you the variable costs are depending on uh, on what is the fuel cost actually so what you see here is that for the electric scooters, uh, the, the variable costs are very low, very, very low. But you also see the total cost of ownership uh, on a kilometer basis. So you see that petrol scooters are around 30 cents uh, per kilometer. Um, and the electric uh, scooter is 20 cents. And the battery swapping is a little more, around 21 cents. So electric scooters here, um, seem to be the best choice. Um, but uh, later we'll, in the next slide, we go into what is the possible range of these, of these scooters, of electric scooters. I mean, we have seen that, that petrol scooters, yeah, I mean, you should uh, leave them out uh, from a cost perspective. Uh, but when we, when we go into more detail of, uh, of electric scooters and battery swapping, what you see is that, um, so on the, on the, uh, on the uh, top axis, you see uh, the, the, the range of a battery swapping, uh, battery swapping scooter. You see that, um, <clears throat> let's say on this time scale of morning nine to uh, night 12, every three hours you can use the scooter. Um, and when the battery gets finished, you can swap it out for the other, other battery. And in the next three hours, the battery, uh, the first battery gets charged, and the second battery gets gets discharged, and you can do this continuously on a um, uh, the whole day, and you can keep the scooter in use for the whole day. Whereas, on for if you are using a, an electric one, you see that you can use it, let's say, from nine o'clock till three o'clock in the in the afternoon, but then the battery is discharged, and then for a long period of six hours, uh, the scooter has to stand still. Uh, while it is being charged, and then later on you have you can uh, start using it again. So you see that the the, the range of uh, of an electric scooter is around 180 kilometers, and that of a battery swapping scooter is 300 kilometers. So that's a very big advantage for for uh, battery swapping. But I mean, one thing to to uh, to uh, make it clear is that this is a theoretical range. Um, this is not. Uh, I mean, in in practical purposes, it won't be um, like you won't with a like with a battery swapping scooter. You won't be uh, riding three hundred kilometers per day. But it is possible. Uh, you can ride, let's say, two hundred kilometers, which is and that is not possible for the electric scooter. Now, when you uh, when we when you um, so in our in our project case uh, this uh, this food delivery company uh, this restaurant chain was delivering around 70 uh, was doing around 75 kilometers per day but what we also saw is that uh, you can you can ride them till yeah 180 200 250 kilometers per day if you are able to do that you see that the total cost of ownership per kilometer is able to fall much lower so um, at 75 kilometers per day, uh, the, the total cost of ownership per kilometer was around 20, 21 cents. But here you see that if you are able to increase it to 180, so that's the, the theoretical uh, maximum range of, of the electric scooters, then the, the costs fall to 9 cents and 10 cents uh, respectively. So which gives a, a very big advantage to especially battery swapping scooters because you can use them throughout the day. We see that the price is not very different, uh, but you have much more operationally, you have much more uh, uh, freedom. You can, you can use them throughout the day. So that's, that's uh, um, and that was our, actually our recommendation to, uh, to use battery swapping scooters. Now, yeah, just to repeat the conclusion. So, uh, yeah, petrol scooters, electric scooters, but beat uh, beat uh, petrol scooters very easily. Um, and if you if you look at uh, battery swapping scooters, they are uh, as you go upwards towards the 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 range that is possible. You see that uh, battery swapping scooters are are able to beat even electric scooters, um, and they they give much more operational freedom to you. Uh, so that those are the conclusions uh, specific for this uh, project, but if you look at if you look at it more um, um, in a more in a in a general way, 
but we also see if you look at uh, what are the needs of of cities urban cities and what are the different modes of transport that are available uh, you see that electric is is quite cheap um, it it suits a very different uh, different kinds of purposes but of course you have to look at so this was a particular business case that we are looking at and and in this particular business case uh, we we found we got some conclusions you have to um you would have different kinds of uh, of business models that would suit let's say an electric car uh, uh, an electric uh, truck uh, for uh, for uh, city deliveries small trucks as well if you are talking about uh, about personal use of scooters um, that will be a different business case so it, it's it's horses for courses for different kinds of business uh, businesses you would have different kinds of business models um but i hope uh, with my presentation i have given you some amount of um, of context of uh, how you can uh, start comparing the costs of of petrol and how electric mobility presents so many opportunities um and not to mention the the kind of advantages it has in terms of reducing the the air pollution the noise pollution in cities uh, which is a big problem all around the world um thank you very much for your attention and if there are any questions uh, i would be glad to answer them thank you thank you very much zubin for your presentation uh, your presentation as much as it is on uh, two two wheelers it still give us some highlights on on uh, how one can actually uh, bring in the three wheelers and what issues they should be expecting in terms of the three uh, swapping and, and the and the cost involved thank you very much for that and um please uh, for participants i would like to welcome you to post uh, your your questions uh, to zubin in the chat and we'll take them in the q a session our second presenter is mr shauri from itdp Mr. Shauri, the floor is yours. He's going to take us through the existing business models for operating three wheelers in Tanzania. Karibu, Mr. Shauri. Asante, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, my name is John Shauri. I work for ITDP and I'm based in Dar es Salaam. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants for joining this session and then. Um, I hope that they will enjoy it and uh, see it uh, more like interactive and interesting. So um, let me share my sorry. Let me share my screen. So my presentation will be on the overview of the existing uh, three-wheeler business models in Dar es Salaam, and I know that what is happening in Dar es Salaam it also happening in most parts of Tanzania. So let's go to the next slide and see what's there. So in this second slide, I was saying that uh, they are spread all over the country and, and particularly in major cities and they, that they are used for passenger freight and, uh, and, fr and, and for passenger and uh, for freight. And uh, as I said that, uh, in many cases, the three wheelers for uh, for freight are normally primarily used at the city center. And then let's look at the existing fleet. Um, most of these uh, uh, three wheelers are imported from uh, outside the country, and they, they come in as, uh, as a fully assembled, or sometimes a semi knockdown that is in pieces or completely knocked down. And uh, uh, they are actually mostly petrol. The conventional one are petrol propelled, and then um, they are used for passenger. And the commercial ones, which are used, they, they actually use petrol and some electric. And this, the, the, the electric one are quite few, and they are not very popular in Dar es Salaam as of now. Um, Uh, once the uh, three wheelers are imported into the country, they have to undergo uh, or they have to be registered with the Tanzania Revenue Authority. And they, 
get a road license for from the land transport regulatory authority uh the two the one the first uh, registrations from tra is to enable them to i mean they are registered to uh, to all motor vehicles in the country are supposed to be um registered by the tanzania revenue authority and pay some taxes and then uh, the in order for the three wheelers to operate uh, as a commercial vehicles they need to be licensed by the land transport regulatory authority so let's look at the numbers um we uh the registration or kind of licensing uh started popularly in 2015 2016. of course they've been used in the past but uh, not very part, uh, particularly for commercial purposes they are actually used for, for private like the mostly by people with disabilities and the like of so the uh, registration and licensing started um, way back in 2015 with few like 2000 plus and then as we proceeded and uh, continued with the registration uh, we see that they, they are increasing in numbers and that means that they, they are gaining um popularity as a mode or transport in the cities And as of now we speak now, there are more than 85,000 um, three wheelers registered all over the country. So now let's look at the financial data. So how they operate. Actually, the purchasing prices uh, depends on the make and the country of origin, and they are in the range of 8 million Tanzanian shillings. This is about, uh, can, can I say? to 3,000 US dollars. And um, the registration is done by TRA, as I mentioned before, and the, the owner has to pay and then she's 95,000. And for the vehicle to play on the roads, they have to be insured. And uh, the norm, uh, insurance premium is um, ranges for, to, uh, up to 500,000 Tanzanian shillings. And this is a paid con, uh, on annual basis. So that each year, of course, it keep on uh, uh, reducing because of the depreciation of the, of the other vehicle. And then the license fees that is be paid to, La, to Latra and uh, it's uh, paid annually and uh, one has to Work it out the shillings 22,000 per year. Vehicle rent, normally the owner uh, you, uh, or the renter, they will also have to pay uh, an amount to the, to the owner. And in the, the normal arrangement here is the, 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 um, the owner could they, of course this I'll, I'll go into the next in the next stage in the next uh, slide but there there are arrangements whereby the owner is paid Tanzanian shillings 15000 to 20000 and this is paid on a daily basis but on it, this is a is, is a rent per day and this could be paid on a weekly basis depending on the arrangement between the uh, the operator and the, the or driver and the owner so now let's look at the business models which are existing in Tanzania or particularly in Dar es Salaam. We've come up with uh, three business models. The first one is um, the operator or the owner. The owner operates the vehicle. That means he purchases it, operates it for passenger say or for, 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 for freight. And he collects the money and pay himself, and they pay for the maintenance costs of the of the, of the vehicle. And then the second the second uh, model is the owner he, that, that that is own and lease. Uh, the owner uh, leases the vehicle to, uh, to to a second person or to another person, and uh, on, on a rental basis whereby um, 
he, he, he takes care of the, I mean, he drives the, 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 uh, the vehicle and collects the fares. And from the fares, he pays, he pays the owner a certain amount of money, which we say it is in the range of 15 to 20,000 teachings per day. And then he pays for the, also pays uh, for his costs and the other, uh, and other like, and cost and fuel. And then we have the third one where we have the, all, that is the arrangement of own lease and transfer, uh, where um, the owner get the acquisition of the vehicle, give it to a driver on, his, on, on, a, on a terms and conditions agreed by both. And then the driver collects the fares and the pays himself and pay also pays the the, the owner a certain amount of money which we just stated and uh, at the end of the and this could be a contract of two to three years and uh, at the end of the contract period there could be an arrangement whereby the vehicle now is transferred to the to the driver and then he becomes the second owner so this is a very interesting uh, model and uh, i see it like it's more of a commercial more commercialized. Um, last, let's look at the at the. Um, let's take a comparison of the three business models. Now, own and operate. That's the first one. Uh, the owner take care of the vehicle. I mean, it takes the position of the vehicle. He registers it and then take the insurance, do all the major maintenance, do major repairs, and uh, take care of fueling, and uh, also collect the fares from the passengers. So in this case, there is no second uh, person who takes care of that. It's, it's, there's no driver for that. It's the owner who is the driver as well. So on the own and lease, um, the owner, of course, acquires the vehicle and also do the registration and insurance and do all the major maintenance, you know. And then as the car is given to, uh, the vehicle is given to the driver, that takes the uh, minor repairs, you know, like ad hoc, maybe small accidents on the road. Also take care of fueling, refueling the, the, the vehicle and collect the fares from the uh, from the passengers, and also pay the rent to the to the owner. So those are the kind of uh, active actions which uh, between the two parties. And then on the third one, where we have the own lease and transfer, you see the uh, the owner now have few responsibilities. Um, he take, of course, he purchases the vehicle, do the registration and insure it, and then gives it to the second party who takes care of the major maintenance, minor repairs and or ad hoc repairs, do the refueling, do the fare collection, and also pay rents to the owner. And after the three years contract or two or three years contract, he take possession of the vehicle. And uh, there could be some arrangement whereby he pays a token amount of money so that uh, the vehicle becomes his. Um, or there could be, there is also another option for, for, for possession of the vehicle whereby if the, 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 the daily dues are quite high, are a bit high, then they can be, he can take the vehicle. I mean, the, the arrangement could be that he takes the vehicle as it is at the end of the contract. This has an incentive to the, to the driver to keep the uh, vehicle in good working uh, um, order so that uh, at the end, so that at the, at the end of the uh, contract period, uh, he gets the vehicle in um, still ready, uh, road worthy and in good and in good order. Um, this brings me 
to the end of this presentation and I'll be happy I would be happy to receive your comments or questions or queries so that we can have more interactive session. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shauri, for that um, presentation. Uh, I think it brings us an overview of the existing business models and how the uh, three wheelers operate in Dar es Salaam. And with that, I would like to welcome Bradley from Autotrack to give us a presentation on financial models for electric two-wheelers operations. Over to you, Bradley. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I will be sharing about financial models for electric three-wheelers operations. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes. Good. So my name is Engineer Bradley Magaya, uh, the current uh, Chief Technological Officer and Director at uh, Autotruck East Africa Limited. And uh, we're going to deal with financial models for electric three-wheelers operations. So a slight introduction to electric three wheelers and e-mobility, especially in Africa or in Kenya, where we are seeing a remarkable rate in the advancement of electric mobility. This therefore requires uh, a sustainable financial model that is practical and basically market centric. Uh, a bit of background for, from us, Autotrack East Africa Limited uh, started in 2015 as a Kenyan based company that um, deals with the design and fabrication of electric mobility uh, products. So far, we have come up with the two products, mainly being an electric handcut and uh, an electric three-wheeler. Uh, since our inception, uh, we have constantly developed new financial models, testing them on potential clients, focus groups, and institutions from government and also uh, uh, from the public side. Uh, so the following uh, models in, uh, that I've stated in this presentation have actually been tried and tested in Kenya with uh, a very huge potential to be successful if well implemented. So uh, during our, our development of, uh, of the models, we were facing three major uh, challenges. One of them was identification of a primary customer or a client or a consumer. Uh, this is usually a big issue, especially for us, because uh, we thought uh, we were going to look at uh, a, a, a certain uh, target group, but uh, eventually that was not the case. So you need to properly identify a, a primary co consumer. And then from there is when you can actually develop a model, a financial model for it. And also the identification of a value, viable value proposition for the product. I mean, uh, as much as the value proposition here is electric mobility, you need to also understand what the client wants, whether it's space, whether it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the tonnage or the loading capacity and all that. So once you identify your value, uh, viable uh, value proposition, then you can easily develop uh, 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 a financial model. Also ensuring the sustainability of the model is very crucial and it's a huge challenge, especially when coming up with a, with a model because if it's not sustainable, then it, it won't make sense uh, later on. So we have uh, currently uh, tried and tested three financial models, one of them being least to own model. I think uh, that one was also elaborated by my colleague. Yeah, and then uh, there's the branding revenue and then there's the asset financing. So what is the least to own model? Uh, this mainly applies to clients who are doing transport business, whether as a passenger service vehicle or a, a freight or a, a logistical uh, 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 business. So the kind of model we developed was a potential client pays a deposit of around 15% and is given the vehicle to operate. Uh, the client is then required to pay the company on a daily basis a certain amount that is calculated to be roughly around 50 to 60% of the client's actual earnings daily earnings. And these agreements normally last between nine to 12 months, after which the ownership of the vehicle is transferred to the client and a logbook is issued to them. Uh, this model has proven very successful, especially when it comes to market mass market penetration. Uh, so it works very well. 
And then now the branding revenue. This branding revenue is basically uh, dependent on the lease to own model where now the manufacturer, you as the manufacturer, can brand the vehicles with other companies' products uh, or services and you get paid during the duration of the lease. So once, uh, once, once, uh, once the, the, the owner of the vehicle now takes over the vehicle, you can either decide to continue uh, uh, doing the branding and getting revenue for it or not. But either way, this increases the manufacturer's sources of revenue. Now, when it comes to asset financing, this is a discussion we've had with uh, several financial institutions uh, in the country, mainly banks, who are more than willing to actually uh, finance their clients who are interested in the electric vehicles, fully pay the, 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 the vehicle, and then the, uh, the bank or the financial institution just uh, deals with the client. So for you as the manufacturer, you just get paid by the bank and that's it. So this uh, it has proven to be a, uh, a bit more secure and uh, a reliable source of revenue. Uh, so yeah, this is also something we, will, we have tried and tested and we will suggest it anytime. So in conclusion, I would like to uh, echo what uh, the ex-chairman of, uh, of uh, Nissan said, the time is right for electric mobility. In fact, the time is critical. So let's get cracking. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bradley, for that uh, brief presentation. And uh, since uh, Bradley would like to uh, excuse himself after his presentation, I would like to welcome any questions for Bradley before he leaves, he leaves us. If we have any questions for him, please you can um, pose the questions to him now. Oh, great. I'm seeing a question uh, from, from Amos Mwangi. Thank you, Amos. And this question says, had the banks in Kenya been able to find a way of operating the electric three-wheelers? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amos. Now, uh, as far as uh, conversation we've had with, uh, with banks uh, like Equity Bank, uh, yes, they have. Uh, they're really interested. I mean, since it's still a new a new venture really. Uh, They're still trying as much as possible to kind of do further evaluation on the business is, itself, but they are really interested in, 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 in doing it since it's also, uh, it's also good for them because it's electric mobility. They, they want to be seen as guys who are actually supporting such. So none so far have been procured through the uh, asset financing? Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, Amos, no, no, none so far has, has actually been procured through asset financing because uh, we are currently we are currently uh, not in a position to actually do mass production. But yeah, they they showed interest in it, and uh, if there is a client of theirs that is more than willing to get into this business, then uh, they're more than willing to 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 do the asset financing bit of it. Thank you, Bradley. Um... Any other questions, please, for Bradley? Otherwise, um, I would like to, we have two minutes before we move to the general Q&A. So if you have a specific question for Bradley, please welcome. Um, so Zubin asks, considering the various operating mo business models available in Tanzania and the cost structure as you detailed for electric scooters, which of the models do you think could easily facilitate the penetration of electric two and three wheelers in the country? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, as, as I said in the presentation, uh, I still believe for mass market uh, penetration, uh, the, the lease to own is, uh, is one of the most viable, uh, one of the most viable uh, uh, models to go with, because uh, you'll find many people will actually get into it because the 15% is not uh, as expensive. So you'll find uh, many people will want to get into it. And then as they're running the, uh, the, 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 the three-wheeler or the two-wheeler, you'll find that they're actually making money for themselves and paying for the, for the, for the, two, for the, for the vehicle itself. So for the, the best, I will say, for especially for mass market penetration, I will say the, own, uh, the least to own kind of model works perfectly. Thank you, Bradley. Um, uh, Judith, can you take over the first question, please, from, from uh, the floor, which was directed uh, to the first presenter? Thank you, Jacqueline. 
Yes, we can take uh, the next set of questions for both Zubin and Engineer Shauri. And of course, my colleague Edmund will assist me with the questions. Um, so Zubin, the first question goes to you. Um, there was a question from Nason Watota who asked, he says he would like to know the maintenance cost and purchasing cost for each vehicle category, that is for both the two and three wheelers. And there was also a question from Yona Africa who asks, does electric battery scooter give automatic swaps for batteries? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, so talking about the maintenance, so um, the, the project for which I did and the data, the presentation I gave, the data I, I shared, uh, for that project, we, um, we looked at uh, the, the the electric scooters here in Netherlands, the scooters here in Netherlands. So I cannot uh, uh, speak more specifically about Tanzania, but uh, for Netherlands, uh, for example, the elect the the um, uh, so these are logistic scooters. Um, for the petrol ones, it was around three thousand euros. Uh, for the electric ones, it was around five thousand five thousand five hundred euros. Uh, the purchase cost, the maintenance uh, was. Um, around 150 euros per per month for the petrol ones and 100 euros per month for the for the electric ones um, so it it is not exactly transferable to tanzania like you cannot multiply with with, uh, with the exchange rate and and it won't be the same but i think it gives you an idea of of the of uh, yeah relatively uh, electric scooters would be around um, uh, somewhere between 1.5 to, to two times the cost of, um, of uh, um, petrol ones. Then uh, the next question was about uh, automatic swaps of batteries. Um, so here in the Netherlands, uh, for the project that, that, uh, that, uh, that we were doing, uh, it was not automatic, but it was, yeah, the, the batteries, battery weight was around 20 kilos. So when the one battery got over, uh, so it so the scooter comes back to the, I mean, it, it's going to deliver uh, food. So it goes and delivers food to uh, food to customers, comes back to the restaurant. And if the battery is over, then you have another battery, which is, which is uh, full. You, uh, if you lift the, the, um, the, seat of the scooter and you it's within one minute you can you can swap it out and it's very easy um so so that's one model but i also see in the so that's that's a very that's the commercial category what i also see in the in the personal category is that uh, there are there are companies who um uh, who offer these for uh, per minute to con uh, to uh, to consumers to normal consumers so you and i anybody can can use those scooters for those scooters what uh, the uh, the model that they, that they use is that there is a truck which has all um, filled in electric scooters and it's the the state of charge of the battery how much uh, bat battery charge is left they can monitor it online and whenever a battery is let's say gets to 20 percent 25 percent level then uh, the, the the truck gets to that to the scooter and and somebody from the company actually swaps it out. Um, so that's that's what I see here in the in the Netherlands. Um, there was a question from Edmund about the operating business models um, from the based on the cost structure, and I I also asked uh, uh, Bradley about it. With who is more um, who knows more about about that particular market. But also speaking from a general perspective, um, and also from, uh, so I come from India, so um, there is a, a big uh, market for three wheelers for uh, for electric three wheelers in India, and what I see there is also, um, so um, Bradley mentioned the lease to to own. Uh, what I see in India is also more that companies actually own the own the batteries, but it for a uh, for a charge uh, so let's say uh, a vehicle owner wants to swap out a battery so for each battery they, they pay pay something for it so they need not own the whole vehicle or own the battery but they actually lease for for certain duration of the day so you can you you pay let's say some amount of money that every time you are going to 
uh, pick up a pick up a, a battery and some most of these are um, in india what happens is that uh, the um, oil companies actually uh, at petrol petrol and diesel tank stations you can also go there for electric batteries and there you can um, you can get a fully charged battery and swap out your battery um, what i also so there are automatic models for it but also um, i mean if you look at at scooter batteries they are not as heavy um, 2 kilowatt 3 kilowatt 4 kilowatt so you can do them by hand they're not very heavy but if you go to the heavier segment towards uh, three wheelers then they would need um, and and yeah an automatic uh, or a mechanized system of of swapping out those batteries and um, yeah in india it's uh, around within 3 to 5 minutes the, the batteries are swapped out um, I hope I have answered your questions. If there are, or if I haven't, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Zubin. Those are very good answers. Thank you very much. Over to you, Edwin, for the next questions. Thank you very much. The next question goes to uh, John from ITDP. Uh, John, Adolosons. Adolosons is the one asking the question. He would like to know. Uh, the availability of spare parts uh, locally in, in Tanzania or in, in Dar es Salaam. If he wants to know whether there are available spare parts uh, for electric three wheelers in Dar es Salaam or in Tanzania. Thank you, Edmund. Um, I'll say that for the petrol propelled um, three wheelers, we have a good number of um, dealers uh, in Tanzania and they, uh, the spares are abundant, I can say. They can, there's no problem in getting a spare for the, for, the, for the three wheelers, which are conventional ones. But for the um, electric ones, uh, they are not very popular and um, actually there are few outlets in the country and I can say that as of now, I can't say, I can't guarantee that uh, getting a um, uh, spare pass as it is for the petrol propelled um, uh, three wheelers. Uh, we, there is a, we, uh, the, the, the market is not that good for the, for now, I can say for the three wheelers uh, propelled by, by uh, electric. So that, that's, that, that's, I think I have answered the question from Nation. So actually for the electric three wheelers, uh, they open after service um, uh, service and the, the people who buy these electric three wheelers from them can always go back for, for the spare parts. So this is how it works for now. You can always go back to the shop where you actually, you had purchased this uh, electric uh, three wheeler and then you get the service from there, including the spare parts and any, any sort of uh, technical advice. Thank you. Great. Um, I think Fanuel will also like to add on. Fanuel. Yes, uh, thanks Edmund and uh, Corinne for the discussion. Uh, it's, I'm not adding on, uh, I, uh, I, I do agree with the, the response from John and, uh, and Jacqueline about the availability uh, of the spare parts. But my question was more generic. I don't know if Shauri or other presenter could assist him. I know we are talking on the business model and they try to share what is going on on the ground in Dar es Salaam. But they wanted to see if they have any kind of thinking how could we structure our business model around the pilot project? Because I would like to see the, the, the to get input from this discussion, informing what we are thinking we are moving forward implementation of the, our, our, our pilot project. Because uh, those uh, the guys who, who they just uh, uh, meet or the presentation made was more from the private thinking of the business model. But I'm trying to see now that given we are a government agents. We are operating buses on the concession or franchise arrangement. And any kind of re uh, uh, replica which we can do for the same or not? What, what, what are the take on that? That was my question. Or even somebody else we have time thinking on that. Thank you. Um, now he's zeroed down to, for the, to the, the Solution Plus project. 
Um, I would say that um, uh, model number three, where we have the risks uh, actually distributed between the two parties, that could be more feasible for for the for the project as of now. Um, also, uh, it is also it. Uh, other than sharing the risks, it's also stress-free for the for the for the owner. Or if the uh, the the, the are to be owned by that, and if they wanted to get a free a, a, a kind of a stress-free contract, then they could, I I, I, I request them to or suggest that they go for or we go for uh, model number three. Model number two could be very ideal to for 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 the for the for the for the for the, for the uh, business community or for the for the who are selling the the, the commodities because they have I mean uh, after selling they have nothing to do with the, with the, with the, with the vehicle so Edmund I'll say that model number three is more appropriate for now thank you. It thanks a lot, uh, John, for the insights. So these are uh, deliberations we can continue to have. At a point, we really need to take the decision. No worries on the side, uh, as we have colleagues, uh, we will come to a good conclusion as to which of the business models we can deploy in the demonstration action. So at this point, I will give it back to Jacqueline. Uh, we have almost exhausted the Q&A session for now. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, I'm not sure if I should uh, quickly say what, what I was thinking about what Manuel was, was asking. Sure, and you can. I, yeah, thank you. I, I totally agree with what um, John is suggesting, but another way of looking at it could be um, just testing all the models and then at the end of the day, draw some lessons from it and uh, use those for scaling up uh, stage. Thank you. Great. So Jacqueline, back to you. Uh, I think we can go into the next set of presentation then we take the, the final Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Edmund and, and Judith for taking the Q&A, uh, the next session of our Q&A. And I would now like to move on to our next presenter. And this is our colleague, um, Gerard from Indiana, and he will take us through a general overview of electric vehicle safety standards, the functional safety and the emergency response. Over to you, um, Gerard. Hello. <clears throat> um, perfect, um, I'll show the, I'll share the screen, just one second. Can you confirm that you can see the screen, please? Yes. Yes, Gerard. Okay. Yes. So uh, I present myself. I am Gerard Bars. I am uh, working in uh, Iriada in the e-power train department. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, electrical uh, safety tests in vehicles. And uh, also I'm also responsible of uh, electric validation of the components, mainly regarding uh, power electronics so in order to to put a little bit of um, a point of view of this presentation i'll take an overview about uh, electrical safety uh, i will take about uh, talk about some regulations that are applied mainly in in europe but uh, as you will see mainly the standards are uh, quite common global wide uh, also, I'll take a, uh, a deep, uh, a, a light, sorry, a light point of view on functional safety, and then I, uh, also a quick review in uh, emergency response. So, in order to start, uh, mainly the the electrical safety is defined uh, by this global technical regulation. This is a document that it's uh, for public access to, to anybody. And it's just uh, a list of uh, different points uh, regarding electrical safety at vehicle level. It's uh, mainly focused on, on, on cars, but the concepts that are applied there can be applied to any type of electrical vehicle. 
uh, this is very interesting because, uh, for example, the European regulation that uh, takes uh, electrical safety is based on this regulation. But uh, also, not only European regulation, but American regulations, Asian regulations, all are based on this GTR number 20. So this is very uh, interesting because in this regulation, they explain you point by point the, the reasons why the, the the safety measurements are taken and why they are taken like that. So uh, I want to get just a, a, um, a quick comment. This is R100, uh, which is the regulation that uh, it's aimed for vehicle safety. Also, it has a part from batteries, but I will focus mainly on vehicle. There is the equivalent in the USA, which is exactly the same the same document. Then there is this new regulation, which is aimed to electrical scooters and, and, and little two-wheelers. And then there is this ICO, which uh, is aimed to motorbikes. And also you have uh, EN 15194 and UL 2849, which the, they are aimed for e-bikes. Uh, one is from Europe, one is for the USA, but uh, the regulations are quite quite similar there is no big changes in between this regulation so um, at the end all this uh, all these regulations and standards what they aim is to check some basic points in the vehicle to ensure that uh, uh, usage of the vehicle during uh, driving or doing uh, maintenance of the vehicle uh, are safe no, in order to, to use the vehicle, because uh, when we think about electrical safety, there is a, a key point, no? because uh, in comparison to combustion engine uh, <coughs> vehicles, we see that, the, the for example, if a uh, combustion engine is broken, we can see smoke, we can see fire, we can see a lot of things. But with electricity, sometimes this is not uh, something that we can see. Uh, maybe uh, the electric shock is something that uh, cannot be easily seen by eye. No? So these uh, regulations ensure that there is no such risk or just unseen risk and the vehicles are, are safe. All these uh, mm, different measures that uh, it's pointing with here in the, uh, in the different uh, regulations are also combined with this other UN which is uh, regarding to some electrical context, which I explain now, and some climatic conditions. <clears throat> the, the main path of electrical safety is followed by protection against indi uh, indirect contact, which is all these measurements that are not uh, directly related with uh, the materials. Then protection against direct contact, which is some enclosures or barriers that can can allow you to touch life parts. And then functional safety, which is related to the safety of software and how the controls of the vehicle ensure that the vehicle is safe. So you know, to give you a quick overview about what this indirect contact is all the measurement, all the measures that you can provide in a vehicle in order to uh, be sure that, that you can you know, won't have an electric shock. No? So checking the insulation of cables, checking that the conductive parts are indeed uh, conducting in case of failure. So in order that when you have a potential electric risk, you won't have uh, uh, damage to the user of the vehicle or someone who is uh, working with the vehicle. Um, also, uh, there is the short circuit prote protections of of, uh, of the vehicles, which uh, all of the vehicles have some uh, fuses and relays that ensure that the vehicle are not uh, will not have any short circuit or any uh, problem of electrical safety. And is the protection of direct contact, uh, which is, for example, the protections that ensure that the vehicle is not. Uh, easily affected by water, which is something that uh, I think a lot of people consider to be a risk in electric vehicles, because uh, we all know that water and uh, electricity, they are not uh, good friends, as I would say. And um, by having some water tests, you can ensure that the water is not entering the component and the component are completely sealed. 
So then there is the uh, IPXD protection, which ensures that the, there is no direct link between the metallic parts inside the vehicle and uh, to the electric circuit. So no one who is driving or just being driven in the car has a uh, potential risk of touching any electrical uh, hazardous parts. And also the protection against wires that they, they have mm, to be positioned in order to not be in sharp edge or that they, they could have some potential risk of being cut. This is some basic points, but they're really important because uh, these at the end is the ones that guarantee that you are not in direct risk with uh, any electrical hazard. And there is the functional safety. Functional safety is uh, summarizing just uh, the measurements that you can think of the system to be safe. This is really important in, in electric mobility because at the end, uh, all the systems have uh, ECUs and little computers that control everything in the car. So there's a lot of software involved, even in three-wheelers, two-wheelers, uh, cars, trucks. All these vehicles have a lot of uh, control and, and with the electric motors and uh, all the electric parts is taking more and more and more importance. So to be sure that all the control and all the software is safe, it's a key point in electrical safety. Uh, I'll just take a quick <clears throat> uh, view on, on how to develop thinking of functional safety. Uh, I'll just go quite quite quick in this point. So uh, when you are designing a vehicle, you need to think about what are your requirements, and then you're doing step by step until you get to the point that you are simulating this software, and then you are checking this software in the, with, I would say, in the software in the loop, then trying the hardware in the loop, and you are always uh, checking the all the parts that you have tested and all the mechanisms of, of safety that you have introduced in your system to be checked and to be step by step and gradually tested in order to verify that the system is completely safe and it's uh, all the functions and all the safety functions that you have implemented in the system they're actually working and then you end doing the first test, and then you are integrating it into the vehicle. So going this step by step and thinking of uh, what are the measures that I shall implement in the system in order to verify that uh, all the lines of code and all the possible risks that you have in the vehicle are implemented. This is key point in order to uh, uh, the, to the software and the system to be safe, no? because uh, one safety measure, it's not maybe related to electrical safety itself, but uh, the points of electrical safety, no? but just in, in order to you have some idea what I'm talking about is, uh, for example, if you park the vehicle, you have to think that the, the steering wheel shall be blocked in order that the vehicle cannot be moved. So you have to think, well, how do I have the, the 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 steering wheel blocked? Do I have to have a a motor or a brake, and this brake has to be activated by this ECU that has to be on, and this ECU has to be on because of this command. So all these different steps shall be integrated step by step in order to uh, be sure that the system is is safe. It's the same with uh, implementing. All, all this, and you have to do this uh, hazard and risk assessment to check that once you have integrated all these uh, parts of the system, then you have to check them and have to see what are the potential risk and, or what should be a misuse of the system in order to verify that once the whole system is uh, implemented and all the functional safety is implemented, that everything is completely uh, safe and on and all the and all the points are completely safe. But you have to think that even though you're having this complex analysis of risks, you have always a little uh, percentage of risk that you are not you have not taken into account, which uh, this can never be zero. But with these techniques, we are reducing it to 99% of uh, I would say safety guaranteed if you were following these steps. 
Um, for example, in EDIADA, we do not only test the vehicle itself, but we, did, we test the components. As the points that I said before, to guarantee that the vehicle is, uh, or the, the, the electric components are not affected by water, we have uh, some, some climatic chambers that simulate uh, humidity. We have some dust test chambers. We have vibration. There's some different tests that can be uh, done in, uh, in the system or in the um, different electric components to, guarantee, to, to verify that actually the, the component is safe to some climatic conditions that might uh, stress the, for example, the electrical resistance or some insulation materials. All these different points have to be checked first in the component and then in the vehicle. And then uh, I'll just a uh, quick overview of what are some of the uh, measurements that are implemented in the vehicle when uh, everything that I have explained uh, is not going well. For example, in an event of, of crash or in an event of, uh, of something malfunctioning, how we guarantee that the, the system is completely uh, discharged and they were not discharged, but there is no uh, electricity flowing to parts that we not desire. Now, for example, this is an image of BMW i3, which, has, uh, which is called the service plug, which is a mechanism that uh, deactivated all the high voltage of the vehicle. This is uh, always in the front part, but there is also uh, this is the case of a Kia Niro, which has a, another kind of service plug, which is uh, this plug that is implemented uh, in the back seat in order to split the battery into two different parts. So there's no electric connection of on any of the components once this plug is, uh, is disconnected. Also, there are some emergency loops aimed for uh, uh, fire workers and firemen in an event of crash. This is the same vehicle of BMW i3, which it has uh, in the charging port, this uh, emergency cutting cable, which is also allowing you to have the car completely uh, the, all the high voltage system deactivated by just cutting this lap. For example, this is uh, the Rivian RTA1, which is an uh, uh, electrical pickup that has been uh, released in the, in the US, so, uh, I think one or two months ago. And they already have this uh, manual of uh, emergency response in the event of crash. So this is shown the two places that there is a cutting lap, a cutting loop that the uh, once cut it, you guarantee that the high voltage is disconnected. You can see that there is uh, two parts because imagine that you have a crash in the front part. So it's important to have a cutting loop in the back part in this event. And this applies also to, to uh, all the vehicles. I mean, if we're talking of uh, an electric motorbike or an electric three-wheeler even though it's a shorter vehicle we have to ensure they have we have these systems of uh, disconnection of high voltage system in an event of of crash there is also another mechanisms that uh, can ensure that the vehicle is safe for example all the high voltage connectors of vehicles they have to <clears throat> to have which is called the interlock which is a uh, little wire that follows all the electric components and uh, if for example we have one cable disconnected or this uh, wire is somehow uh, broken because of a crash or uh, um, or an or this kind of events uh, then it automatically disconnects all the high voltage systems by opening the relays of the high voltage battery also Another important point is the disconnection of the 12 volts battery. It also ensures that the, there is no power to the ECUs or to the control boards, which uh, by, uh, by construction, if there is no power in an electric vehicle, all the relays and all the high voltage systems shall be automatically disconnected. So uh, when there is a crash or there is something that you don't want to happen into the vehicle, 
you are sure that there's uh, no electrical connection to the vehicle. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I will uh, gladly uh, uh, respond to that. Thank you very much, uh, Gerard, for that uh, insightful presentation. And I see you have questions already, but since we have a Q&A uh, section after the last presenter, then I would, I would rather take them at, the end, uh, at that Q&A session. And so with that, I would like to welcome um, a note from TBS to give us an overview on um, the local specific safety standards for electric two wheelers. Over to you, Arnold Karibu. Yeah, thank you. Let me share the screen. Good morning, everybody. This is Arnold Mato. I'm a standard officer from Tanzania Bureau of Standard. I'm responsible for development of standards and the automotive and automotive components. So I'm responsible for development and developing the standards and the, and the transportation sector. Uh, so can you just go to the next slide, please? Yes. So Tanzania Bureau of Standard is a sole national standard body, and uh, the responsibilities of the body is to develop, uh, I mean, to formulate national standards, uh, participate in formulation of regional and international standards, or also to implement the standards. Once we have developed a standard, we have to, yeah, to make sure that uh, it's implemented. So it's also our responsibility. We do also do provide trainings to the standards uh, to the stakeholders whenever there is a need to uh, to elaborate about the standard uh, about what are the requirements of the standard yeah so we do also provide trainings yeah uh, we also do certification for products and services yeah for instance somebody is, is manufacturing of three wheel or of electrical also whatever so we do also do certification as a part of uh, quality assurance next slide please yeah, so we are we are we are very much related in, uh, to international standard organizations, which is ISO, International Organization for Standardization. Yeah, and TBS, we have been a member of the organization since 1979. And by being a member, we have uh, some uh, some benefits of, of being a member of these international standard organizations. We enjoy membership by adopting standard. We can adopt it uh, directly. I mean ISO document and of all sectors, including the transportations. And the good thing is that we have access to all these documents. We have direct access all, all the time. So we have, a, uh, we have a library for these documents, for ISO, ISO documents. Uh, by saying so, we, I mean that we can also, we can also implement the international standard, uh, standards, not necessarily uh, adopted standards. We agree and we, we, we recognize uh, ISO standards. Yeah, what we have here in place uh, at the moment for uh, yeah for electric mobility, we have a Tanzanian standard for three wheelers. Yeah, it's uh, TZS one two three one. It's part two. Part one of it is uh, two wheelers, and part two it's three wheelers. Uh, it is of two thousand and twenty. It's, it's a new version. It specifies the general 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 specification for three wheelers. Yeah, and this is standard to, to give uh, provisions for, for primary mover of internal combustion engine as early as a, a electric power. So it's one standard in, in, in it and it gives a specification for uh, internal combustion engine prime mover as well as electrical powered prime mover, which is electrical uh, uh, three wheelers. Yeah, so the standard, it covers the uh, safety performance characteristics of the three wheelers. Yeah, including uh, the dimensions, safety dimensions, the prime mover, I mean the internal combustion engine as well as electric power. Yeah, it's also a uh, specified performance and, and operational requirement as well as uh, identification, which has to be identified with the bike identification number. Yeah. Uh, and this is standard, it covers uh, uh, three wheelers motorcycles with uh, less than 1,250 kilograms. And the current vision of the standard, it's a third edition, and it has the final, final stage uh, for gazettement. It doesn't have any other uh, technical technical uh, stage. So it's uh, about a month to come, the standard will be 
will be uh, will be gazetted. And what 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 made us to revise the standard in the year 2020? There was a request from uh, uh, I don't remember which company, but they were uh, requesting for development of standard for electric three wheelers. So we thought instead of uh, uh, preparing a new standard, we amend our standard and include the uh, prime mover of uh, electrical power. So that was the main reason of revising the standard and the new vision of the standard. Yeah, included the uh, electrical powered uh, prime mover. Yeah, we do also, as I said earlier, we recognize international standards, uh, ISO standards, and what's uh, what 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 uh, I mean, international standard available for these electrical propelled vehicles. We have a standard for ISO 6469 for the electrical propelled road vehicles. And there are four parts of the standard, part one to part four. Uh, part two is the most important. However, do not uh, not all, all others are not important. But two, but two talks about the safety requirements of the of the vehicle, and also there is an important uh, international standard for the same, which is uh, ISO 8715. It's electrical vehicle road operation characteristics. The, this is standard specifies the the road operation characteristics how 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 should be uh, operating in the road. And the third one. Yeah, we have a, a international standard 13063. It's electrical propelled mopeds and, and motorcycles uh, safety specification. So we, we do we do recognize and we, we 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 have access direct access to all these three international standards and we can use them at any time as well as uh, we can adopt them as uh, as uh, as national standard whenever it arises. Yes, my, my, my presentation was very short. I can conclude that uh, you know, TBS as a, as a national standard body uh, uh, is in collaboration with other uh, institutions that are related to uh, transportation. And uh, with those who are uh, interested with uh, electric vehicle using local and international standard, and also TBS will, will develop and will be ready to to adopt the electrical standard whenever there is a request or whenever there is a need. And, and we finally ensure that we continue cooperation with all institutions and stakeholders under the transportation sector. As I said, my presentation was kind of short and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. It's very impressive to see that TPS is actually ready for the electric three wheelers. So, I mean, if, if the country is to take the, the EV direction, then we can count on you. It's very good to, to, know, to know that. And it's very encouraging to hear that coming from you. And of course, I'm also glad to see that um, our colleagues from Idiada had actually um, highlighted some of the standards that, uh, that they've been looking into and the international standards. And, and of course, that kinds of points and charts away for, for us to uh, look at when we are ready for this. Thank you so much for that presentation. And with that, I would like to move to the Q&A session. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. And also thanks so much to our speakers, uh, Gerard and uh, Arnold. We have a few questions. Perhaps uh, we can start with uh, Gerald. And uh, a question is coming from Jensen Schumer. Uh, Jensen Schumer says that, are there safety measures considered for harsh conditions of the tropical uh, areas, particularly in Africa, considering that there is high temperature compared to Europe and the US. Jara, mm -hmm. is my question a bit clear? Or yes, yes, it's, uh, it's perfectly clear. And uh, I, feel, I think it's a very interesting question. So um, I would try to, to explain it uh, as clear as I can. So the safety measures that uh, I have explained and they are related to the vehicle, they are uh, not directly related to to harsh conditions uh, because the safety measurements are not dependent 
on harsh conditions. But what is dependent on the harsh condition is the product development and how the products are manufactured. You know? We have uh, experience working with uh, some uh, manufacturers and some OEMs. And uh, then they have, uh, for example, different uh, temperature and targets depending on the market that they are focusing. So, uh, regarding to the to your question, what uh, I would say is the uh, if the manufacturer is aimed to uh, to manufacture it in Af and to be manufactured in Africa and uh, having uh, which I assume higher temperatures and maybe more dust conditions, then this validation has to be done in the product development for just to, 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 to have a, a quick overview, no? For example, uh, some manufacturers, they uh, have different components for, for example, the Russian market, which is very uh, low temperature based than, for example, low uh, or southern part of, of, of Europe. So I, I could assume the same, no? You could design the component for these harsh conditions, but at the end, you will end up doing the same um, safety test, which at the end, they ensure that the vehicle is, sa is safe, no matter what are the conditions. No? Because if the, the company is not, is the, not designed for the temperatures, then when you are doing the, the, the safety test, you will check that there is something wrong with it. There is a follow-up question to that, and it's coming from Imos Mwangi. Uh, Imos says that for countries where they largely rely on importation of electric vehicles, and at best assemble electric vehicles, will you recommend a number of high level safety checks that can be used by standard bodies? Okay, so uh, I, I understand the question. Then um, I would always recommend to, to have uh, high standard safety checks in electric vehicles because of what I said in the presentation. Electricity's uh, hazard is not something that can be seen by a bare A. So it's very important to, to have high standards because uh, not only for the electric shocks that can, have, can, can happen to people, but also the risk fires, for example, for batteries. Um, I've heard a lot of times that uh, some battery manufacturers uh, in Europe or in America or well, all, all over the world, they have had uh, fires because uh, it's quite easy to do to, to something go wrong with, with uh, electric. But if uh, you are following high standards, it doesn't matter if uh, it's because you are Im importing something from other countries or you're fabricating itself. Having high standards of, of electrical safety will always be something uh, good and important to have to ensure that, that everything is correct. Because electricity is not hazard by itself. If you have uh, the, the safety guaranteed. And then maybe uh, a last one also uh, for you. Uh, in the same uh, line, this time around, touching a bit more on, on uh, three relays. So let's take it. Um, considering that it is important to keep electric uh, vehicle batteries and uh, the wiring system uh, safe from harsh climatic conditions, and then also knowing that electric three relays have some of their parts or some of its parts usually exposed, uh, will you recommend any measures to ensure that electric three wheelers in particular and its parts remain safe for users? Mm -hmm. yeah, so this, uh, what I would say uh, is uh, when designing the vehicle and when uh, having this uh, first uh, phase of, of uh, assembling the vehicle, uh, the most important thing is, is that all the components are designed to have this, uh, this harsh condition. So once you have the component, you have to validate the, 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 the component and testing it. For example, uh, if you are you're expecting to have your three-wheeler uh, temperatures over 40 degrees, uh, then, then you have to design your testing 
and the testing of the component and these uh, very high temperatures and uh, these very uh, dust conditions and to check that the component is working as you ex are expecting in, this, in these conditions and even put more harsh conditions to the component to see what, where are the limits of it. And then you have this part uh, validated, then you can be sure that the vehicle will be safe even in harsh conditions. Great, amazing, amazing, amazing responses over there. And I believe this will indeed uh, be very valuable for our local innovators uh, on the ground who will who are also assembling or even are intending to assemble uh, electric three wheelers uh, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, we will take the next set of questions and uh, I think this time around, uh, we will be going to Arnold. The first question is from Jensen Schumer and he's going to Arnold. Um, is TBS aware of the number of electric vehicles operating in Tanzania? Yeah, as TBS, we don't have an actual number in place now, and there is a, an organization which is responsible for land transportation regulatory authority. It's LATRA. They register every vehicle that is in the road. Yeah, what we do have in place now is a, a number of suppliers because we have to certify these uh, uh, manufacturers and suppliers. We can have uh, a number of brands or a number of suppliers who are supplying this kind of vehicles to Tanzania, but actual number of users, uh, we cannot have uh, exactly at any time, but we can get it from a, a land and transport uh, regulatory authority. They register every vehicle. We can share, we, sh we do share information. So whenever we need it to know the actual number, we'll get it from there. But at, at the right now, we don't have an actual number. Thank you. Great, amazing. Uh, there is uh, a question from Dennis, but I guess that is already answered via your presentation. But let, let me ask again uh, for purposes of uh, emphasis. Uh, the question is that what e-mobility electric vehicle and charging related uh, regulations does Tanzania have formulated or adopted? So let me take it again. What electric vehicle and charging related regulations does Tanzania have formulated or adopted? Yeah, as it's a new sector, I mean, the, the electric mobile, it's a new sector in the country. We, we don't have a place in place this station uh, right now, but as I said earlier, that we can we, we can use our international practices. We can, we can adopt the electric, I mean, international practices, ISO. Uh, um, and we can in the future adopt uh, these practices and documents to, to regulate the same. So at the time, at the time now, uh, we don't have uh, this, this station, we don't have this document for, to regulate. Thank you. Great. That's really interesting uh, to know, May, meaning that there are efforts being made uh, to put in paper these regulations. And then I believe once you have them, then implementing them will also be another stage. There is a, a final question uh, to Arnold uh, from Shukuru. How do you ensure that the registered vehicles uh, by other bodies, for example, that are of required standard? Yeah, uh, this these are the regulatory authorities like LATRA and uh, and, and Terra A. They will not register any car before they get our test report before they confirm that the uh, the, the, the equipment is a uh, its quality to the standard. So uh, the two the two uh, the two institutions who are responsible for registration they will do after confirming the STBS that uh, the equipment is uh, it's safe and it's it meets it's, it's it qualifies to the standards. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Maybe a final question. Uh, maybe that might be coming from me myself. So, um, Arnold, uh, this one goes to you. Typically, maybe in a sentence or two, um, if you have a local innovator who intends to assemble electric vehicles in, in, in Dar es Salaam or in Tanzania, could you, in uh, just a short, uh, um, with a short explanation, explain to us what such a local innovator needs to do to get 
through the regulatory uh, processes to get the vehicle pro uh, process and then certified. Oh, yes, the, first of all, have to submit the specifications to TBS, and, and TBS will uh, will review the specifications and uh, and and relate it to available standards, uh, just to ensure that the, the product will be safe uh, in electrical and as well as as a roadworthiness. And with that, we have technical committees. It's not only TBS that uh, that will decide. We have technical committees uh, with experts from uh, all sectors of the transportation. From research, from industries, from all the aspects, uh, from all the uh, sectors, and then we validate the specification in relation to the standards. After then, uh, the normal certification process will uh, proceed, and then registrations. Amazing, amazing information there. Thanks so much, uh, Arnold, and uh, thanks so much to your colleague Yona. Also, uh, uh, we so much appreciate uh, this this uh, insightful explanations from you. Thanks a lot. And I'm giving it back to Jacqueline. I think that uh, ends the Q&A session. Jacqueline, back to you. Thank you so much, Edmund. And thank you all the participants and the speakers for this uh, very uh, interactive and insightful session. Uh, since I'm the moderator, I'll just have a small question to Arnold. <laughs> And that one is just a follow-up question on what Edmund had just posed as the last question. Um, you really explained well what one, one has to do or what procedures one has to follow when they want to assemble, let's say, an electric three-wheeler. But I'm wondering now who initiates this in terms of, uh, okay, if this, this particular innovator comes to you, uh, does TBS now start um, um, organizing all these committees and who funds fund this process. So does the fund come from TBS? Does it come from the person who is submitting the 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 um, the E3 wheeler uh, initiative? How how does it does this uh, process happen within within the TBS and the other stakeholders? Thank you. Yes, yes, the committee. Yeah. Thank you. The committees are for, for, for reviewing and validating these uh, specifications uh, uh, sponsored by TBS. It's our responsibility to develop a standard and to validate these specifications. So the, the activity of validating and uh, and, the, and consulting this uh, innovator or the uh, technical aspect, it's a TBS responsible and it, it's, 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 uh, it's sponsored by TBS. Uh, but the development of specifications for this, it's responsibility of the innovator. So the, uh, the innovator will be advised by the technical committee on what to do to improve uh, the innovation. If there is uh, any, 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 any issue to, to, to be advised. So uh, the, the, the validation process is uh, sponsored by TBS. Uh, the certification will, uh, will will depend on uh, how big is this innovator. If it's a it's a it's a small uh, entrepreneur, we have a program to help them certifying without payment for the first three years. We have this program, but if it's a uh, it's a big manufacturer who can pay for testing and all what uh, on all these uh, certification processes have to pay uh, just the testing fees and inspection fees. Uh, we, we are not TBS as a TBS is not a, a, a trading institution, but it's a service institution. So yeah, it's like that. I'm sure it's kind of a satisfactory. My answer is. Yes, very satisfactory. Thank you so much, Arnold. Um, this kinds of help our innovators to know where to start and how to go about things. Thank you so much. This is very helpful for the pilot projects that you're implementing. And without further overdue, uh, again, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. And I would like to welcome you and Habitat Dad and ourselves for final remarks. Uh, Judith, over to you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline and everyone. Once more, my name is Judith Oginga. I work for UN Habitat in the Urban Electric Mobility Initiative. It has been an absolute pleasure having you all join us. We started on Monday uh, and Tuesday with the Kigali training. Then we went Wednesday and Thursday. We have been dealing with Dar es Salaam. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for all your questions. I will take this opportunity to also remind you that the Africa Regional Training is not done. 
tomorrow we will be having the Kenya National Training and you are all invited to attend this. Um, and I hope to see all of you here. Um, if you have any questions that you feel have not yet been answered, feel free to first of all, visit our website and to find the resources that we shared from the first part of the training, which was at the end of September. Many of your questions are probably answered there. And if you still have any burning questions, feel free to reach us on email. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending and I hand over back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. And with that, I would like to welcome that for their conclusive remarks before my colleague Edmund also um, give, give our conclusive remarks. Over to you, Dad. Thanks. Uh... Jacqueline and the team for organizing this wonderful day session training. Uh, it has been uh, good and collaborative and very informative presentation. And we believe uh, with this kind of uh, exchange, it will enable us to now start pushing the implementation part of our pilot project. Uh, nevertheless, we are still uh, on learning curve. We will continue participating to other uh, session, which will be organized by the uh, uh, union and, and, and the ITDP and the other participants, so that we keep running this uh, new development and innovation. With that said, I thank you all, and I thank all the participants, my colleagues from Dar es Salaam, and other people who have participated in this uh, day session. Thank you so much, and success. Thank you so much, Kalugendo. And with that, I would also want to uh, invite my colleague, um, Edmund, for the final remarks. Welcome, okay. Edmund. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who uh, had the time to join us. And uh, uh, it was indeed a great session. And then we believe that the Solutions Plus project will continue together with our partners uh, to bring electric mobility uh, to Dar es Salaam uh, through all the activities we are doing. And then indeed, it was good to have um, our, the local stakeholders here and we would like to forge this collaboration. And uh, indeed, we will be reaching out again uh, through various other means and then uh, other engagement as well. So it is not the end of the road. We will say a big thank you and you will hear again from us and have a great day. Thank you so much.